All right, so we've quickly gone through periodic law. We're going to introduce this. You went through the lab today, so you should be good to go. Now, quick thing. When we talked about general properties or having similar properties, again, focus on the fact that we were looking at chemical properties. Chemical properties were represented by the formulas XCl, X2O, XH, etc. And when we saw groups with the same properties, you saw XCl down one column, you saw XCl2 down another column, etc. Now, notice that the physical properties were not the same. The physical properties were things like melting point and density. So we didn't see any kind of pattern or trend with that per se related to how they were organized. Now, keep in mind that background-wise, this is talked about extensively in Chapter 5 at the beginning of Chapter 5, so make sure you do the reading, okay, and look at that and look at the background and how they came up with this. And what we really care about is the fact that Dmitry Mendeleev did this. He predicted the existence of elements, okay, and that's kind of huge in terms of organizing a periodic table. So when we look at this, if I have, all right, so what we look at here, as you see my little line, is basically since he predicted the existence, you can look at what the actual was worth compared to what he expected it to be, and you can see that there's that huge similarity. He really was very close because he understood how to organize. He understood what the predictable periodic properties were. Okay, now, then we get to Mosley. What Mosley came up with is he figured out the atomic number. In other words, he figured out that there was something inherent in each atom that allowed it to be organized, and as soon as he organized it by atomic number, he figured out that all of those inconsistencies in Mendeleev's table, like you guys noticed in the lab, it, those disappear. As soon as you put it in an atomic number order, all of those inconsistencies eliminate. And so now we get his periodic law. The crucial thing about his periodic law is actually a couple of things. That both physical and chemical properties are a result of the atomic number. Notice that we call them functions of the atomic number. Okay? So, in other words, when we look at atomic number, remember we're talking number of protons. So literally what we're saying is the physical and chemical properties are a direct result, a function of the atomic number. This is huge as we move on in terms of periodicity. Now, why we also care about this is because of okay, our electron configurations. Remember, these are the halogens. The halogens are in S2 and P5, so S1, S2, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. Okay, so what we look at is we see that the chemical because of their electron configurations. Every family has the same electron configuration, therefore we see similarities in their chemical behavior, their chemical properties. Okay, now, periodic properties. So let's watch the little video. There, there, whoops, dang it, let's try that again. Quick time, there it is, play. Well, apparently we're having problems, guys. Hold on. Sorry about the dead time, guys. Here we go. In the periodic table, the elements are in order of increasing atomic number, which corresponds to the number of protons in the nucleus. The elements are arranged in rows, with elements of similar electronic configuration arranged in columns called groups. For example, the elements sodium through argon form the third row of the periodic table. Each row of the periodic table shows the same general trends and properties as the row above it or below it. Indeed, this is why we refer to it as the periodic table. At present, there are 112 known elements, though for some unstable elements, only a few atoms have been made. The metallic character of the elements increases as we move downward in any given column and in moving from right to left. The alkali metals of group 1 are the most metallic of any group of elements. Cesium and francium are the most active metals. Non-metallic character increases as we move from left to right in a given row and as we move upward within a given group. The halogens, group 7, are as a group the most non-metallic elements. Fluorine is the most active non-metallic element. 
Okay, guys, so a couple of things that you, you should have picked up on that in terms of the notes. Okay, first, make sure you know what makes something a metal and what makes something a non-metal. And again, then recognize that trend. As we move down and left, we get the most metallic. As we move up and right, we get the most non-metallic. And notice that the noble gases were not included. Okay, the noble gases were not included when we talk about the most non-metallic, okay? So make sure you know what metallic properties are, make sure you know what non-metallic properties are. That way you can predict and come up with an idea of what properties are decreasing as we move down and left and what properties are increasing as we move up and right. Okay, so that brings us to our basic family. Quick review. S-block metals, we're talking S1 and S2. You do have to know the name of the families, alkali versus alkaline earth. You need to know about their properties. Okay, we've defined ionization energies, we've defined densities and melting points. The big thing here, and guys, this is the metal reactivity lab, hint, 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 okay? So your expectation, your expectation for your lab is based on what we just talked about, based on this, this idea of metallic and non-metallic. You should be able to have in your expectation for the lab tomorrow, your expectation should be what do you think is the most metallic to least metallic. Okay, now um, we know that they are going to react with water. We have lower ionization energies, alkaline earth metals, which you already know when you looked at the cards. In other words, as you saw from left to right, you already know that ionization energy tended to decrease. I mean, tended to increase, sorry. Ionization energy tended to increase from left to right. So it makes sense that the alkali would be more reactive than the alkaline earth. Okay, so that brings us to D block. In general, D block. D block is what we typically think of, you know, it's the typical metal. It's that quintessential metal. Iron, nickel, copper, chromium. Those are all the typical metals, but these are D blocks. Now, notice some characteristics that they have in common. Notice how they differ from the S block metals. Okay, and they typically form brightly formed compounds. So even their solutions are bright solutions. So we kind of see that color associated with it. It's also this coloration that gives um, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, you know, different gems their characteristic colors is we see some of these chemicals as impurities in the crystals associated with that mineral formation. Okay, P-block metals. All right, the great thing about the P-block metals is you have to recognize what's going on. So we have properties varying by family. Well, that kind of makes sense. But notice that we also go from an element columns that are mostly metals, okay, which would be your NS2, NP1, all the way to the halogens, which are mostly nonmetals, and eventually to the noble gases. So we see trends both in terms of varying properties from left to right, the trends that we would expect to see, ionization energy, atomic mass, all of those things, but we also see changes in terms of metallic and nonmetallic down a family because we see both metals and nonmetals in these columns in the P block. Okay? Because again, if we start with a nonmetal and we end with a metal, we're definitely going to see some very significant changes in behavior. Okay. Now, the P block metals, when we look, oops, I skipped one. <laughs> the noble gas, the halogens are kind of important. The halogens are the typical, okay, the prototype for nonmetals. Um, halogen is, we've talked about this before, halogen means salt former, so that's where we get these. So sodium chloride, potassium chloride, uh, potassium bromide, all of these are considered salts. These tend to react directly with metals. They also all exist, one of those things you're supposed to memorize, they exist as diatomic elements. So just kind of know that about these, this family. Okay, now the noble gases. You should recognize that this is our emission spectra. Okay, and you can see how we have some changes as we go through. The big thing with noble gases is they're noble gases. Noble means inert. Inert is related to the fact that they have this S2P6, completely full valence electrons. The last group we're going to talk about are the F-block elements. Okay, so these are your lanthanides and your actinides. Um, when we talk about them, the interesting thing that you should have noticed with the D block, all of the D blocks were very similar to each other. You saw very subtle changes. There's only going to be slight changes as you move left to right. Um, very subtle changes in terms of the differences in properties. With the F block, it's even less so. 
the F block there virtually interchangeable with each other. So there's not a lot of difference between them. This is pretty much what any F block metal is going to look at. Now this is actually actinium, I think, or ytterbium. Maybe this is ytterbium. In any case, pretty similar to what they all look like. Okay? So we're going to go through, give you the questions, make sure you pause. So here's your first question. Pause it. Answer the question before you go on. Pause it. Okay, pause. All right, guys, we're pretty much done. 